I really would like to, to ask Lakshmi to talk a little bit about her creative writing and the development of her work. As I said, she's one of our finest short story writers in Tamil, but it's also, I have had the privilege of seeing a wonderful development in her work. And I'd like to take you through some of the themes that she has been working with. They're very unusual, very experimental. And she also writes beautifully. But uh, in the first instance, I want to ask Lakshmi to make the distinction between her writing persona as Ambe and uh, her Tamil creative writing persona as Ambe and her persona as a critical writer but also director of Sparrow as C.S. Lakshmi. I think I once made the mistake of mixing the two categories and got ticked off very thoroughly. So, um, Lakshmi. Thank you, uh, Lakshmi, for those uh, kind words. Yeah, we've been uh, working together for uh, three decades now. <coughs> and uh, we enjoy doing this work together. It also allows us to argue and fight and disagree and then arrive at a translation which uh, both of us like. You know. And uh, as Lakshmi always says, uh, translation is never complete. So we time and again keep going back to the translation and see how we can uh, improve it. Uh, my um, writing person, Zambai, it uh, began much before uh, the research as C.S. Lakshmi, because uh, I started writing at the age of uh, 16. And, uh, and I wrote for the same reasons that many young girls would write at the time. Because I grew up in a middle class uh, household where uh, um, like today, children were not allowed to go and play with friends in the evenings and, uh, or visit friends or have night overs, and we didn't have those things. So a lot of the time was spent at home. So once you came back from school, and those were those glorious days when we didn't have homework to do. So we did all the work in the school. So there was uh, plenty of time. And uh, as a very shy girl, and... Uh, as a dark girl in a family, which always worries about how to um, get this dark girl married. So I grew up with a lot of uh, complexities uh, about uh, myself. And the only confidence I had was the language I had. Because my earlier education was in Tamil medium. So I started writing initially diaries. And then uh, long letters. And then, like most uh, uh, literary aspirants, I started writing poetry. It took me only very little time to realize that, that poetry was very bad. And uh, then I uh, broke into uh, small stories. And then uh, uh, there was a children's magazine called Karnan, which advertised uh, novel competitions. I was 16. And I wrote a children's novel, an adventure novel, which was actually a novel for myself. And it won the first prize. And it got serialized in that uh, journal. And immediately after I went into writing uh, what is considered adult uh, stories. And when I was about 19, there was another novel competition in an adult journal. And I wrote a novel. And the novel reflects what I was at the time. The novel is all about uh, platonic love. It's because, uh, you know, we grew up in an atmosphere where the body is never mentioned. Menstruation is not talked about. So we were kind of floating in a bodiless space. So the novel also reflects that. In order to write about platonic love, Either uh, you should have transcended the body or you should be totally ignorant about the body. In my case, the latter was uh, the truth. So this uh, uh, platonic uh, uh, love story where uh, the protagonist and uh, her lover exchange uh, their souls 
one uh, the second prize by the time it got serialized i got out of the house and i was already teaching uh, as a village uh, school teacher and i was greatly embarrassed by the novel i felt that it was written by somebody else and because those three years out of the house had changed me entirely the story that i wrote after that were very different and the stories that i wrote after i came to delhi when the c is lakshmi who did research because i came to do my phd in jnu and uh, that's when the research personality came up and uh, the research experiences began to be uh, um, incorporated into my writing after that after i came to delhi in 1967 Yeah. really always um i wanted to to uh, talk about some of your earliest themes after you left behind those very early stories um i know that you have never liked to be distinguished as a woman writer um nevertheless there are themes to do with women and uh, one of those is to do with spaces special to women uh, to do with communication between women and i'm thinking particularly about that splendid story black horse square which is part of a purple sea i was thinking of that story lakshmi recently in view of the the rape case in delhi and i was thinking how that story you wrote 15 years ago was it is so relevant to us today but what was special about that story wasn't even the focus on the rape though that was a special theme but how do we speak about this how do we find a language in which to communicate this experience and particularly to to do it with a sensitivity and you were talking in that story about the women's movement which was largely made up of very articulate middle class women and here was this rosa who found it so difficult to speak about a very personal experience and you the, the protagonist and the narrator finally are able to come together and to speak about can you talk a little bit about women spaces and particularly this business of communication uh, yeah in the morning when i read from uh, black horse square i was really transported to those days in uh, <coughs> bombay when we took up the matra rep is and the march and we did so many things i was uh, sometime back in uh, sweden and uh, in a conversation like this a person asked me that there was a male indian writer who had come before me to sweden and uh, they asked him uh, how he writes the uh, stories and he had said that he gets up every morning and he opens the window and stories come to him like winged birds and they asked me what i thought about it i told him i had no problem with the metaphor it's a very beautiful metaphor but the thing is that you need a window to open and you need time to stand by the window and you need a family that will allow you to stand by the window and wait for these winged stories to come and i told him that i'll tell you about how women write it's not just a question of having a room of one's own it's also a question of having the space to develop a language of one's own how does one overcome the language that's surrounding you all the time when uh, i was in my teenage years there was a the famous tamil film called manamakkal 
And whenever guests came home, children were asked to dance for it. And in school, we did. The problem we had was, uh, how does one do Abhinaya for a good woman? How does she look? How does the good woman look? You know? And uh, this conflict that we had of, is this what a good woman is supposed to do? Raised several questions in all of us. I think that Many of us have gone into different fields, but these questions have remained. That who is a good woman? And that became a kind of a question that I constantly uh, began to ask. That what should I do that will not allow me to be labeled in any way as a good woman or a bad woman, but as just me? Is that possible? So these were the questions that came up when I began to write. And Lakshmi said that I don't like to be uh, known as a woman writer. It's true. Because uh, when in Tamil Nadu they call you a woman writer, it's not just a gender uh, uh, quality that they are talking about. They are actually talking about the quality of their writing. Because woman writing is considered inferior. When they write the literary history, they never mention any of the women writers. So when I published my second short story collection, Kitchen in the Corner of the House, um, in fact, Lakshmi, in that uh, Black House Square comes in 87, not 15 years ago, much. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because it was in 81 that the Mathura tape case was taken up. This so, uh, so normally when a book is published, they write a blurb at the back, isn't it? So that book had some 13 stories. Out of that, about uh, five stories, let us say, or four stories, had what you can call a protagonist. Although uh, my stories don't have that kind of protagonist. And the rest of the stories were different. One story was about a pig, and another story was about a river, and another story was about a yellow fish. So uh, this friend of mine who was my publisher, he wrote on the blurb that these are stories on women. And these talk about women's lives and things like that. But he didn't know what to do with the rest of the stories. There were only four stories that spoke about women. But what about the nine other stories? So he wrote, there are also some experimental stories in this collection. The rest of the stories were all experimental. You know. So I wrote back to him saying that I don't uh, experiment with stories. And in Tamil, the word for experiment is shodhani. And that's also the word for torture. So I told him that you can say I'm torturing my readers, but you cannot say I'm experimenting. And I told him that uh, you will never say this for a male writer, that he's writing stories about men. He said, no, I would do it. So I told him, no, you just published a collection of a very well-known writer called Muthus Ami, called Nirmai in which from the first story where a third, three-year-old boy falls into a well, all the stories had made protagonists. But he wrote that these stories are about life. I said, so men write about life and women write about women. I said, how can I agree with this? But he was a friend, so I could fight with him the way I fight with Lakshmi. So... He finally, in the second edition, he changed the blood. But I don't think that any other writer would have objected to that kind of nomenclature. Because many good writers before me, like Rajam Krishnan and others, 
they could write in the blurb that among women writers is a good writer, whereas she's a very good writer. But she never objected to that. But someone had to be there to object to it. So once I began to object, there were other women writers who said, we also don't want to be called women writers, if it means this, you know. I would like now to read a little bit from um, one of my favorite stories okay. <laughs> and uh, ask you to comment on, on it. This is, this is a very um, a complex story. On the one hand, it's retelling the Sita story when Sita is much older, but it's interleaved with the modern story of a woman who also is rejected in her older years. Although all her life she has supported her husband in the end, when it comes to a, an equal position in this company, um, she's not allowed that. But it's most interestingly interleaved. So uh, it, it is this retelling of the Sita story as well. And I want to read the last bit, which is an un encounter between Sita, the older Sita in the forest, and Ravana, who is now a music teacher and is also in the forest. And um, this is after this is after Sita refuses to return to Ayodhya. She takes her own path, um, and she comes across Ravana. She arrives. She, she, she listens to his music, and this is what he says. She looked inside. Someone who looked like a tapasvi, living a life of austerity, was playing the vini. When she asked whether she was disturbing his practice, he said no. He had been waiting for her. He said, don't you know me? I'm Ravana. Startled, she stepped back. I thought you died in the war. This life is full of magic, is it not? When Rama demolished everyone in my palace, there was one bodyguard left. He pleaded with Rama to spare his life, and he then prayed that a friend of his should be returned to life. Rama did so, and told them both to flee before Lakshmana appeared. When they said they could no longer, that they no longer had the strength to run, he gave them wings. They changed respectively into a kite and a parrot and flew away. This is a story that people tell. Could I not be that parrot that has been flying about in, this, in these forests? A parrot waiting for that moment when he would meet Sita once more. A tired old parrot. And Sita says, even now, this infatuation, I have seen so many tragedies. My life has been like a game of dice in which I'm a pawn. I'm tired and weary. I'm more than 40 years old. And Ravana says, it is then that a woman needs a friend to support her when she's distressed by her changing body, to save her, to encourage her, to stand at a distance and give her hope. Um, Ravana went on, uh, I have never refused to give my friendship to anyone. Before the battle began, Rama wanted to perform a puja. There were only two people in the world who could have conducted the puja for him. One was Vali, the other myself. Rama had killed Vali with his own hands. So I was the only one left. He sent an invitation to me. I went to him. I did the puja as he desired. I blessed him and invoked his victory. Sita addressed him by name for the first time. Ravana, words make me tired. Language leaves me crippled. I'm fettered by my body. 
Ravana smiled. The body is a prison. The body is a means of freedom, he said. Look, he said, showing his Rudravini, a musical instrument which was created by imagining what wonderful music would sound if Parvati's breasts, as she lay on her back, turned into gourds and the nipples attached by strings. It's an extension of Devi's body. You lifted Shiva's bow with one hand. You should be able to conquer this instrument easily. Will you try? Will you teach me, she asks. I did battle for you once. Would I deny you music? I will be your guru and give you lessons every day. Let the music break out of the vini and flow everywhere in the forest. Don't think of it as an ordinary musical instrument. Think, it, think of it as your life and play on it. Here, he lifted the Rudravini from his lap and stretched it out towards her. Leave it there on the ground, said Sita. Why? It is my life, isn't it? A life that many hands have tossed about like a ball. Now, let me take hold of it, take it into my hands. So she saying, Sita lifted the Rudravini and laid it on her lap. Now, I think that's a most wonderful retelling. It's really, isn't it? Isn't it? So, um, I wondered if you'd talk about your particular take on this later Sita. Actually, uh, one uh, grows up listening to the Ramayana all the time, as uh, many uh, girls from South India will know that uh, grandmothers at home or mothers, they keep telling the story of Ramayana. It so happened that uh, my mother conceived me during the uh, World War times when the uh, third child was actually a luxury. And uh, she was in great distress because they didn't, she didn't want the child. So in those days, there was no abortion. So she had taken many uh, spurious medicines to kill the fetus. But the fetus refused to die. So then she gave birth to the child, and she was very scared that the child may be born with a defect. The child was not born with a defect, but the child was very dark and very weak. So for the first five years of my life, my mother would spend all that time uh, massaging me. And while massaging, she would press hard so it would hurt. You see. So she would tell the story of Ramayana. And she always told the story of uh, um, the Ashrada not having children. And then he gets this pudding and then he gives it to his queens. And Rama is born. The birth of Rama was something that she always told me about. And I always imagined that my mother also would have taken that kind of a pudding, you know. And I knew much later that she had taken these spurious medicines. So this tale of Ramayana remained within me. And uh, during those days in Bangalore where I grew up, there were many, many um, storytellers, what we call Kadagalachivam, and narrators, and they will come and tell the story of uh, Ramayana. But I always noticed that whenever they told the story of uh, Ramayana, it was always the story of Rama. And Uttara Ramayana, where uh, uh, Sita goes to the forest and gives birth to love, Kush, and all, is never mentioned. And is never uh, talked about, either at home or outside. Ramayana ends when they come back and have the Patavishegam, and there is no more Ramayana. You know? So I was curious to know about uh, Sita. And in my um, 
डांस क्लास दी डांस मास्टर्स वाइफ एट अ सिस्टर जयवंती वाज अ वेरी गुड सिंगर सो व्हेन एवर वी वेंट फॉर परफॉर्मेंसेस दे वुड आस्क हर टू सिंग एंड वंस शी सैंग अ मराठी a song which said ja sang lakshmana sang ram rajala that is go and tell rama sita says because i'm pregnant because if you don't tell him he'll suspect this also and there was so much anger in the at uh, song and so much pathos so this personality of sita continued to for uh, me and uh, in one of those uh, uh, narration story narrations once a uh, narrator said that that day he was going to uh, uh, narrate the story of uh, agni pariksha and the hall was filled with women that day and uh, when um, rama tells her that uh, he was uh, quoting from the valmiki ramayana he says that uh, i have not fought this war for you to save your honor i have fought this war to save my honor and you have no directions where you can go i have done it to save the honor of my ishwa dynasty he says So at that time, Sita tells Lakshmana, "You light the fire," she says. So I suddenly realized that the hall had gone dead silent, and every woman was weeping. So I realized that this is not a moment in an epic. This is a moment that must be happening every woman's life. So I was only about thirteen, fourteen at that time. But from then, this curiosity did not go to see that was there. So maybe in this uh, story, there since there have been so many retellings of Ramayana, like in the story you will find many retellings that have come from the North East, from the Himalayas, from so many places. So I thought I should have a retelling of my own, and. that thing about the veena being her life actually i was um, a student of uh, dagar sahab i wanted to learn uh, rudra veena from him when i was in dagar when i was in pompe and he told me uh, you come after two years he just wanted to know whether i was really interested maybe so i went after two years and i told him please teach me He said, "Yeah," and he told me to come on some day, and I went. He was inside. I was waiting for him. His wife came out. She's a sitar player, his own student. So she asked me, "Have you come to interview him?" I said, "No, I've come to learn Rudravina from him." She said, "You can't play the Rudravina." She said, "You're very small." She said, "You have to turn your body like this." I said, "It's true." Rudravina is a very heavy instrument, and you have to turn your spine in a particular way in it, and you need very long fingers to do that. So I said, but he asked me to come. He told me we can't play the Rudravina. He told me, but I waited for him. I went inside. I told him that uh, we used to call him Bade Ustad. So I told him Bade Ustad, uh, we can't play the Rudravina. He told me who told him. I said, uh, Babi Ji was saying. He said, people just carry you. He said, those were Maranis who played the Vina when they were, they played Rudra Vina. And he said, a woman who can give birth to a child can do anything. If she can give birth to a child, she can also play the Rudra Vina. He told me. Rudra Vina is a very um, expensive instrument, so I used to play on his Vina. So um, when he gave me his Vina. He told me, you know, Lakshmi, you should not play this uh, as if this is just an instrument. You should play this as if this is your life. And only then you can handle it, because he had a habit of uh, just teaching you the first line and then going away. Then you have to keep on practicing it. 
So once I was practicing it and I was thinking in my mind that, you know, I'm learning this instrument at such a late age and I hope uh, I can teach everybody what I can do. And I was thinking all that and especially an aunt of mine who used to ridicule me. So I said that I'll teach her what I can do and I was playing. So after half an hour, everybody was that came inside and he told me, you know, Lakshmi, you don't, while playing, you don't have to think what all you will teach others. You just play on. But I wondered how he knew. He knew by the way I was pressing the strings, you see. He said, you don't have to think, I will teach you, I will teach you. You will teach me for And he said, but this is your life. Why should you teach anybody anything? And I thought that uh, I learned uh, more about life uh, than about Meena from him because he died very soon after that. And uh, this thing about uh, Ravana saying, this is your life, I imagined uh, Ravana to be Padevstad, you know, and telling Sita that, you know, that's how that came. You a lot more about your books, and I would like to. But I think we really need to move on and talk a little bit about your um, archive, um, the sound and picture archives <coughs> for research on women. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how that initiative was started and uh, how it's developed? Actually, in uh, 1974, I got a, a fellowship to do research on women writing because I wanted to know why women write uh, what they write. And uh, many who knew that I was doing this research uh, came and told me, uh, wouldn't you get a better subject to do research on? In what have women written that you can write a whole book about? It? <coughs> and then when I began to look for a written material, anybody in research would uh, consider that books written by women would form my primary material, isn't it? But according to the regular research, books and other printed works are considered secondary material. So everything that uh, was written was considered soft material. So the interviews I was doing with women, which they all said were anecdotal, so cannot be history. And the questions I asked women, all these fell in the category of soft material, which was not considered hard material for research. So after finishing this uh, uh, research, I got so much of uh, uh, material. And a friend of mine, another friend of mine, an American friend of mine, Professor Geraldine Forbes, she had also done some uh, research. We wondered, where do we put this uh, material, you know? And then uh, um, myself and two other uh, academics, Dr. Neera Desai and Maitri Krishna, we thought of setting up a women's archives. And archiving is not considered a part of development. All women's groups were expected to do were developmental work. And what was development? 100 sewing machines to 100 widows. Or kitchen gardens for <laughs> women. Or self-help groups. These were considered development. But qualitative work in women's studies was not considered part of development. So we have been really swimming against the current and this year is the Silver Jubilee year of Sparrow. And if it is so, it's because we have really struggled. So in Sparrow we keep uh, um, interviews uh, which we call dialogues actually with women from all walks of life, including writers, artists, activists, professionals, artists, so many others. And uh, we do many activities, we publish, we uh, um, make films, we collect material, we conduct workshops, we hold cultural festivals, we hold women writers workshops, and we do many things. 
and uh, we document all of them because we feel that at any other ends this will be history this will be women's history so this is an activity that is as close to my heart as writing is that sounds wonderful but uh, can you tell us where they are is housed and how you know people can use it in the archives is housed in uh, mumbai in a place called daisar we now have a small building of our own and we keep all the material here and uh, sparrow also has a website where time and again we put up our newsletters our annual reports and everything and those who want to consult they come to us and uh, some scholars from abroad sometimes when they ask for digitized uh, material we do give them um, some of the digitized uh, material that we have because almost everything that we have has been digitized so although we don't have online consultation we feel that people must come to sparrow and consult the material because that's a way of knowing the variety of material we have but uh, our films the 25 films we have done in 11 years are put up on a website so the films are there for people to watch it is on a website called the culture unplugged in uh, bombay it functions from pune so all our films are there but some of the project reports and other things we do are there on our website so people can know what kind of material uh, we archive catalog of uh, your material so that you can check what yeah yeah we do have a catalog and uh, when someone wants uh, to know what kind of material uh, we have we send an uh, online catalog for that particular push um, i think that brings us to the three books that we want to launch um which are produced by the archive by sparrow this is so well wrapped up that it seems to no, be impossible to <laughs> to unwrap but uh, eventually there we are the christmas package and i'd let you There are three of these. Hot is the moon, which I believe is the first one. This is the second one, being carried far away. And then this is the third one, sweeping the frontier. These are all. Uh, it's part of a project we are doing called Literally, where uh, we are interviewing. We have interviewed more than 100 writers. So this is 87 writers from 23 languages which we are going to bring out in five volumes. So these first three volumes are ready and the other two volumes are uh, on the way to the press. But to say just a little bit uh, just to say a little bit about the moon that I know really quite well hot is the moon. It's uh, it's quite a remarkable collection of interviews with established women writers or younger women writers and uh, uh, this has canada and tamil tamil women writers and the format is quite an extensive interview where the women writers speak about their work their lives how they came into writing and all these uh, really interesting background materials and this is followed usually by a piece of work a sh short story maybe a bunch of poems in translation so you get a very complete feel of the interview with the the writer followed by examples of their yeah. writing um and what are the other two? what are the regional areas that you yeah in the uh, second one we have covered uh, northeast and then uh, uh, konkani 
and then uh, we have also covered uh, Telugu in the second one. And the third one has Malayalam and uh, 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 Garo and uh, Manipuri and some of the Northeast uh, languages. Now, uh, in uh, um, being carried far away, when we use the Northeast uh, languages, we realize that uh, none of the Northeastern writers had really been uh, interviewed. And uh, moreover, when we had a culture festival, uh, we, organized, we organized a festival with Northeast as focus in Bombay. And uh, many people in Bombay came and asked us, uh, why do you want to have a festival with non-Indian uh, people? Because they didn't even realize that uh, Meghalaya was a part of India. They said that these are not Indians. Actually, the cultural festival was held. To, it was a film festival to tell people that everybody doesn't look like Shah Rukh Khan or Amitabh Bachchan. So we had all these uh, stars from Northeast, from Assam and other places, visitors, we invited them to be part of the festival. You wouldn't believe it. There was not a single journalist willing to interview them. From the uh, way festivals go, this festival was a great failure because there was absolutely no media uh, publicity. But the festival was a success because these Northeast directors and stars, they came and hugged me and told me that uh, nobody has invited us for any festival anywhere so far. Maybe national festivals, but not otherwise, you know. And then um, within the budget, we were trying to give them dinner in some big hotels. And also they told me that, uh, but you know, we want to come to your house. <laughs> So I told him that I have a very small flat and uh, you may not be very comfortable. They said, no, but we want to come to your house. And then there were some 20 of them came to my house and they told me that in Northeast, unless you invite somebody home, it is not considered hospitality. You can keep them very happy anywhere, but unless you bring them home and share food with them, we have not been hospitable. We learned so much from those. Those films were beautiful films and they were national award winning films. But there was nobody willing to see. Somebody came and told me, why don't you have a festival of Shah Rukh Khan films? Hall will be full. So by doing these things, we have learned a lot. Doing these interviews have taught us about so many ways of life. There is a beautiful interview with Bama, right, whom uh, even uh, Lakshmi has translated. Uh, she talks about her life, and uh, Bama comes from an um, agriculture Dalit family. Father was a sipa in the army, and they were poor. And she finishes her school, and she does well. And the nun in the school tells her, you must go to the college now. And uh, her mother says that your father may not approve. But Bama says, uh, and the nun is telling me to go, the mother superior is telling me to go. The mother superior gives her the money, tells her to go to Tirnal Valley and join the hostel and the college. So Bama goes in the dress that she is wearing. And the mother says she'll go home and bring everything. Meanwhile, Bama goes because the last date will be over. She goes there, she joins the college with the help of this mother superior's letter. She is given a room in the hostel, but she has no clothes to change. And she finds that all the other girls come from affluent families. And she waits for her mother to come. And the mother comes uh, next day in the e evening, she comes. She has sold off her earrings to... Uh, she has pledged her earrings so that she can buy her some clothes, some decent clothes to wear. And uh, there is no place she can make her mother stay because she can't afford a guest room. So the mother and daughter, they sleep in that watchman's cabin that night. So every time Bama talks about it, she cries. And I don't think that she has narrated this uh, particular story to anybody. 
she said that it's not because I'm ashamed of it, but she said that the emotional pain is so much that I'm not able to bear it. So in these uh, interviews, which we call dialogues, we are able to bring out uh, so much about women's history, education, and so many things. And from these uh, dialogues have emerged so many other uh, dialogues. Because we allow women to digress. We don't say they talk only for 10 minutes. You know, we interview for hours together. I spend one whole day and night with Mama to interview her. Just a few minutes, so I think we can have a few questions. These ah, books are available for sale. You can buy it from me. Um, hello. Your short story is Kuro. Um, is among many readings prescribed to the Delhi University first-year students. Um, my question for you is that you use a lot of metaphors to talk about women in a patriarchal, wor patriarchal world of writing and a writing world created by women. So my question is, why did you use a metaphorical medium to talk about this? Which metaphorical medium? Uh, squirrel. It's squirrel, at yes. of, because you have it in your text. Yeah, and I was very <laughs> curious why you use so, much, so many metaphors, mm. especially of uh, the squirrel, yeah. to talk about women's writing in a man's world. Yeah, actually, uh, um, in the archives that I worked, there was actually a squirrel <laughs> which shared uh, that those particular shelves with me. You know? It was there throughout. Every time I went up to do the research, the squirrel was sitting there, you know. So, uh, in my story, it became a kind of a metaphor. And at the end of the story, you will notice that the squirrel lies down, facing the east. In the ancient Tamil poetry, that was a, that was a gesture of uh, um, giving up one's life. So, a lot of this combined, and that's how I use the squirrel. I didn't choose the squirrel out of nowhere. It was there. The actual squirrel was there. <laughs> and that's how that story came up. So, um, first of all, it's such an honor to see both of you on stage together because uh, your wonderful, beautiful stories are accessible to us through Lakshmi Holmstrom's wonderful, beautiful translations. So, really. Um, my, uh, I have. Well, one, first of all, the story that you t uh, told from uh, which, uh, which you somehow transcribed in a thousand words, One Life, I think yeah, it's yeah, called. Yeah. Your, uh, it's a very beautiful story, one of my uh, deep favorites. And um, the, the fact that you're talking about that transition from the um, process of birth in the house to going to the hospital, I think is so deeply significant in, in India today when everyone is changing into a new world without thinking about it. So first of all, I, that moved me very much. Oh, that uh, particular story. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> um, but I wanted to ask you actually, um, your influences in writing, uh, they came surely from all over, but your prose is so particular. I mean, not only your voice, but also the fact that it's so, um, um, in some ways spare, you know, and, and, and strong. So I wondered about your influences in writing, uh, if you had any particular comment about that. <laughs> I um, always am a little worried when I write about uh, overwriting. You know, when um, you do the alap of a rag, you should know when to stop. And I think story writing is similar. That uh, you should know when to write that last word and not uh, overwrite. So sometimes uh, my sentences are just two words or sometimes just one word. And that uh, rhythm uh, is almost like a musical uh, rhythm, you know, which sometimes there is just a twist. And then that thing ends. Uh, the story writing is also similar, I feel, you know, because uh, music has been very close to me in my life. Uh, uh, till I lost my voice in 74, I used to sing. So um, 
a lot of what I do, I come back to music. I think music is a continuing metaphor yes, yeah. in, your, in your writing. Uh, any more questions? We could take one last one, Hello. I think. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, my name is Mahendra. Uh, if you have to suggest a few differentiators between an Indian story, Indian short story uh, written in English and, and, uh, and a story written in vernacular, if you have to suggest a few differentiators between a story written in English and a story written in a regional language. Sorry, I'm, I'm he says, thinking. what is the difference between a story written in English and a story written in one of the Indian languages? Uh, I wouldn't know how to differentiate it because um, we live uh, at, in a time when for many people English is their mother tongue, you know. I can say that I'm writing in my mother tongue because I think in Tamil. But for many people I know, including my youngsters in my own family, they think in English. So I feel that they write in English. But uh, uh, writing in Tamil doesn't necessarily involve writing only about things and elements and metaphors within the Tamil culture. Because those who don't live in Tamil Nadu, those who have taken the language out of uh, Tamil Nadu, they write very differently. So I feel that the language is not restricted to a region. It is uh, always a language that can take you places. We'll, we'll take one last question. Uh, is it okay if I do this in Tamil? Yeah. Ambay, madam. You are the same as the same as the same as the same as the same Sorry, ma'am. Sorry, sorry. Uh, you have to say that you have to say that you have to say you have to say that you you have to say that you have to say that you you have to say that you have to say that you have to say you have to say that 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 you have to those were all very innocent poems. Those poems talk about loneliness and uh, which a teenager at the time feels, you know. Those were all very simple, innocent uh, poems. As innocent as my platonic love novel. <laughs> we very innocent poems. Our Thank you, Lakshmi. Remember to get the books. Get the Gentlemen, thank you very much. I apologize again. I'm sorry we are not able to take uh, too many questions because we have the next session that will begin in just a few minutes. Our authors will be available for a book signing session at the book signing desk outside uh, Baithak. Thank you very much. You have been a wonderful audience. Thank you.